fabulous. And a really great conference that you put together. So let's have a... Introduce the last speaker, who's uh, Jake Rasmussen, going to tell us about toroidal three manifolds, curves, and sutures. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a real honor to speak at this conference for Tom. I mean, Tom has been an inspiration for everyone working in floor homology and gauge theory, of course. But it's actually always amazing to me, kind of the breadth of subjects that he reaches across. If you look at his students, they, you know, they seem to do everything. Um, so it's a, yeah, he's just amazing. Um, so happy birthday, Tom. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, I wanted to talk about an extension of work that I've done a while ago with Jonathan Hanselman and Liam Watson. And uh, maybe let me motivate it first just by talking a little bit about satellite knots. work in progress. So um, let's say we have a companion knot C inside of S3, like Juanita was talking about yesterday, and then a pattern knot P inside of S1 times D2. Then, of course, I can write S3 as the exterior of C union S1 times D2. I just remove a neighborhood of the knot and sew it back in. And uh, inside of here is P, and so then uh, P sits inside of S3 in this way, and uh, then it's called the satellite with pattern P in companion C, and we think about it as a knot in S3. Okay, and so maybe you're obligated to draw at least one picture. So here's some satellite of uh, the trefoil. Like Paolo, I really can't draw. It's a table of the trefoil. And uh, it's known, it's probably a theorem of Seifert, that the Alexander polynomial has very simple behavior under the satellite operation. So if I take the Alexander polynomial of SP, this is just the product of the Alexander polynomial of C evaluated at t to the winding number of P times the Alexander polynomial of P thought of as a knot inside of S3. Okay. And so a very natural question is what is an off floor homology of this satellite? And Peter was talking about uh, sort of soccer team's worth of thesis subjects. Uh, I don't think you could write, maybe make a soccer team of people who've written thesis, theses on this question, but you, you certainly have a respectable basketball team, at least. <laughs> and uh, so maybe it you know, sort of starts with the work of F. Dakari and Hedden. So Ethikari considered Whitehead doubles, and Hedden considered cables, and also Whitehead doubles. And what they found was that in these particular cases, there were sort of formulas for the knot floor homology of the satellite in terms of what now we would recognize as the sutured floor homology of the knot complement, the complement of a companion knot, sutured along some slope. So I take two curves, two parallel curves with slope alpha on the boundary of this knot complement. Okay. And another way of thinking about this group is just that it's the knot floor homology of um, the knot inside of the Dane filling complement with slope alpha. Um, and then I take the core knot, which I'll just call k alpha. And 
course, uh, I mean, a lot of the work that Aftakari and Hayden did was understand what these, to understand what these sutured floor homologies were in terms of the original not floor homology of C. Um, okay. And so then, sort of after this, bordered floor homology. And along. This, of course, is due to Lipschitz. Thurston. And already in their very first paper on this subject, you know, there's a wonderful example at the end that everyone should read if they haven't, uh, where they make some computations for a cable of the trefoil knot. And that's a, an inspiring example. Um, and so then, uh, using this kind of technology, lots of people with proof theorems. Um, Kova, Adam Levine, just to name a few. Okay. And uh, so the gluing here that you do in the bordered floor homology is along the surface of genus one. And in that case, um, there's this sort of curve invariant. Um, that I defined earlier with VM and Jonathan. So and maybe let me just briefly recall how that looks. So if I give you M, boundary of M is a single torus. Then what do I get? This gives me, let's just call it hf half of m. Overload this symbol a little bit. Um, what is this? This is a collection of burst closed curves. Possibly equipped with local systems. inside of a cover of the boundary of m minus a point. Okay. And then there's a pairing theorem that says that if you take, say, hf hat of a closed manifold obtained by taking two manifolds like this, m1 and m2, and gluing them together by some map phi, this is sort of, I'll write this as hom. This is hom in the Fukaya category, but it's really just computed by pulling these curves tight and counting intersection points of phi of An important thing about these curves is that, you know, for simple manifolds, you can actually compute what they are and write, you know, write the answer down, and it's simple. Okay. Simple manifolds have simple invariants. So, for example, um, so the two simple manifolds, say I have S1 times D2. Okay, so actually, in this case, the cover is a punctured cylinder here. And, uh, Invariant is just a straight line between two points. I guess on the cylinder, it's a circle, flat circle. Okay. On the other hand, if I had the exterior of the trefoil, um, how does that look? Again, I'll draw the cylinder. Let's identify these vertical curves here. A couple of punctures. And the invariant of the trefoil looks like this. Okay, so if I wanted to compute um, the Dane filling um, trefoil, maybe with plus one slope, um, HF hat of the exterior trefoil filled along slope plus one, well, I pair these two invariants. This is just a straight line, essentially. So I pair, I just, as 
that I just draw a straight line of slope 1 here and uh, count the intersections. And there's just one. Um, I guess the mention of this, I should mention that we're working over field of characteristic 2 since we're doing border floor homology. Um, so this is one dimensional. That's because this is the Poincare sphere. Well, on the other hand, if I wanted to do minus one surgery, then I could just do kind of the opposite slope. And here I'd see three intersection points. Minus one, that's going to be three. This is Brie scorn sphere sigma 237. Okay. Um, another thing you can compute from this picture is not floor homology. So for example, if I wanted to compute HF k hat of, let's say, k alpha contained in m of alpha, so I take my manifold m. Dane fill it along slope alpha, and then there's a core knot k alpha inside of there. Um, this is just given by taking the pairing, you know, just write pairing instead of hom, of Lagrangian L alpha with m. And this Lagrangian L alpha is now um, non compact. example for the Rignal filling. This is a non-compact curve between two punctures with slope alpha. So for the meridional filling, it looks like doing this. So here, you see that I have three intersection points. That's the non-floor homology of the trefoil in S3. Um, and you can see the Alexander gratings correspond to the different heights here. Okay. If I wanted to, for example, do the knot floor homology of the core knot inside of this stain filling, I would instead use this slope. I find I had something of total rank five. Okay, so that's kind of the picture in the closed case. And so the question I want to talk about today is what happens if instead we don't think about closed manifolds, but maybe instead think of links inside of manifolds with torus boundary. And so there's maybe a more natural general statement in terms of bordered sutured floor homology, but since Trying to be a little bit simple here, I'm just going to restrict to this special case of links. Okay, so um, yeah, suppose we have boundary of M into torus, and then I give you a link L inside of M. Um, and maybe I'm going to fix K a, K a component. And now if I just go ahead and run the same machinery, really, um, what do I get? So state it this way, so theorem, um, there's, and again, this is, you know, this is really nothing more than the same kind of thing that's already you know, things I did with Liam and Jonathan applied to this particular case. Um, so there's an invariant, let's call it little HFL on L. Okay, so what, what is this invariant? What form does it take? Um, I'm trying to be a little bit specific. Because um, actually, be specific about spin C structures here and what cover I'm thinking about. Because both of those things are actually rather different from what happens in the closed case. So here I'm going to sum over a set of spin C structures. Let me write this. Spin C of uh, exterior of L relative to the boundary of M. Of course, for each 
spin C structure, I get a sum and, uh, let's say HF hell of L S. Um, this lives in some partially wrapped Fukaya category of um, a covering space TM bar. Um, okay, modulo and equivalence relation. Okay, now, now what I'd like to do is maybe try and explain what each of these pieces are. Okay, so this set, spin C of L boundary M, um, this is just in bijection with H lower one of EL modulo um, the image of H one of the boundary, boundary M. Okay, that's the outer boundary, as it were. Um, this covering space, so there's a covering map, pi mapping from Tm bar to boundary M minus Z again. Okay, and the pi one of the cover is the kernel of the map from pi one of boundary M minus Z to naturally goes to H1 of M. Okay. All right. So some comments about this Fukaya category and the equivalence relation. The first thing to say is that, again, there's a structure theorem that says that, well, you can just think about objects here as being, this is sort of a union of now arcs with ends on the punctures. And again, closed curves, local systems. Okay, and um, here, in the, the original paper I wrote with Jonathan Lee, and we gave a direct proof of this. Um, here, we could also just be kind of lazy and use the theorem of Haydn. In this case, I have been lazy and just referred to this theorem of Haydn Katsarkov. I can't say that. Let's see that this is true. I don't have a direct proof. Um, Okay, and what's, the, what this, what's this equivalence relation? Uh, roughly speaking, what this equivalence relation does is it divides out by the operation of Dane twisting along the boundary components. Okay, so I forget about twisting along more twists. So the punctures. Okay. And um, so I've uh, admitted I chose this component of L and then forgot to include it in the notation. Okay. Um, okay. So what, what, what was I doing when I chose this component? This is a sort of reduced version of the homology. There's also an unreduced version. Um, right, so I define an equivalence relation on um, objects in the Fukaya category, okay? And uh, so, uh, you know, I think one way that you could define that equivalence relation is to say that two objects are equivalent if they're related by Dane twists around, you know, maybe several of the punctures. Right. So notice that once I've defined that equivalence relation, there's no longer a well-defined Hom pairing on this quotient. Okay, so that's an important point.
Um, maybe because maybe because I'm bad at algebra. I mean, you know, that, that I mean that might equally, you know, this definition is mostly designed to draw pictures with. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, this might not be the best thing to say. Um, so remember, we took the covering space of this thing, right? So this has a puncture. In the cover, I'll get probably a lot of punctures, actually. Yep. Uh, well, it's because I didn't define the invariant, right? Um, but, you know, so if, if you know a little bordered sutured floor homology, what, what did I do here? Um, I, I have a manifold with a bunch of boundary components, you know, EL. Um, I put little disk suture, you know, little sutured regions that look like disks and all but one of them, and on the other one I put a tube that goes out to the exterior. Okay, and the fact that, uh, you know, that when I put that tube there, I made a choice. Right? And the, this quotient here is designed to divide out by that, you know, give me something that doesn't depend on that choice. Okay. Um, so there's also an unreduced function. Um, what does the unreduced version look like? Well, one way to think about it, I'll write it, HFL of L. Now it doesn't depend on a component. Well, this is the tube cutting um, bimodule applied to the unreduced version. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, In terms of what I just said to Marco, um, rather more concretely, like if I have just an arc between two punctures here, um, what, it, what does this do? Um, it replaces this with figure eight. And uh, okay, on the other hand, if I had a closed component, I'd probably get two components, parallel components with opposite orientations. Um, and this is very similar to an operation in tangle floor homology studied by um, Kotelsky, Kirk, Harold. Um, similar operation. Okay, so then the pairing theorem says that if I want to look at, say, I have L1 inside of M1 and L2 inside of M2, and I have phi mapping from boundary M2 to boundary M1, then I could glue them up and get a link inside a closed manifold, and HFL cap of um, L1 union L2 sits inside of M1 union along phi of M2, is going to be hung, I'll just write pairing again, of say so little HFL of L1, I reduce along some component, and big HFL of L2. Okay, and one, one interesting case that you might consider is where one of these links is empty. Maybe M2 has no link in, inside of it at all. Well, then I obviously can't reduce. I can't, there's no component to pick. But I can still consider the unreduced version, and that's just, so, if L is the empty set inside of M, HFL, L is just H of hat of M. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is this is awfully dry. Um, ah, oh, good question. Right. So notice that this unreduced homology. This is a compact object in the Fukai category. Okay, and there's not a well-defined pairing between two 
non-compact objects once I divide it out by this equivalence relation. But there is a well-defined pairing between the compact and a non-compact. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah. It's very important that one of these two things is compact. Okay, so um, let's consider a couple of examples. So first, a very trivial example. Say I just have this knot inside the solid torus. Um, so then the first thing to understand, what's the covering space? So here Tm bar is actually just looks like R2 minus a lattice of points. Okay, so maybe I'll just draw the punctures as dots. Um, this, you know, this is canonically identified, for example, with H lower 1. So R2 is H lower 1 of boundary M. So I should choose some coordinates. Maybe I'll call this direction A and this direction B. And this is A and this is B. Um, and there's only one spin C structure in this case. And so the invariant here just looks like a little arc like that in the direction given by A. Okay. And for example, this has to be the answer. Okay, because one thing that this pairing theorem says is that if I take and glue this solid torus into a knot complement, such a way that I get the original manifold back, um, then this should just give me the knot floor homology of that knot. Okay, and that's exactly the description of the knot floor homology in terms of this picture over here that we already knew. Okay. So this is, the yellow is say little hfl of L. On the other hand, maybe I could draw an orange, big HFL, that L looks like this. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to compute um, the regular link floor homology of the hop link, okay, well, I could get that by sticking two of these tori together. One of them I use the unreduced invariant. The other one I use the reduced invariant, and I see maybe we'll draw that blue. All right, so the pairing here, four different possible pairings arranged in this pattern, which if you're familiar with the link floor homology of the hop link, well, that's what it is. Okay. Um, so that's a very easy example. Next example, well, let's just consider the next easiest example, um, which is the knot, the pattern that gives us the 2 1 cable. Looks like this inside of the solid torus. Okay. Um, so here it's again true that Tm bar is R2 minus C2. Okay. If I'm looking at sort of Knots in the solid torus, this is actually always true unless the winding number is zero. Um, but now the, the set of spin C structures has two elements in it instead of one. Okay. And um, two spin C structures, S0 and S1. And um, what does little hfl look like? It's like this. So I just have a pair of little arcs. And uh, what do I want to say? Um, a good exercise is to figure out how to compute the link floor homology of this link. I get by gluing in the hop link from this picture. I won't do that, but instead I'll talk about sort of what the Euler characteristic um, of 
means in this case. Okay, so the general rule of thumb is that uh, right, if I have knot floor homology or link floor homology, the Euler characteristic is supposed to have something to do with the Alexander polynomial or the Torai of torsion. Right, so how, how do I see the Euler characteristic in this picture? Well, it's just the homology class given by the ends of these arcs. Sort of um, homology class is a boundary of HFL. L, um, let me just say this determines gives say um, triad torsion of the exterior of L times the product one minus M I over all the link components L I. That's the usual formula for the Euler characteristic of link floor homology. And what do I mean that it gives it? Well, notice that this thing here naturally lives in something that looks like Z of H1 of boundary M. It sits inside of Z of H1 of M. Um, but this is, a, you know, it's not a surjection here. This, in this case, for example, this is M1 and M2. Um, and this is Z adjoining M1 and M2 squared. Right. And so you have to combine these two pieces together to get the full Euler characteristic. That looks like. Here's one of those two pieces, and here is the other. Okay, and so the Euler characteristic here looks like one minus M1 uh, plus two M1 minus M2 times 1 plus M1 M2. And this is the Alexander polynomial of that link complement. Okay. So coming back again to satellites. Um, well, maybe first we could consider groups at the groups HFK had of our satellite. Um, well, this pairing theorem just tells us, right? It says that I could write this as HF hat of the exterior of the companion um, paired with HFL of the pattern. Okay. And again, let's just consider an example of how that looks. Maybe I'll pair, I'll compute the 2, 1 cable of the trefoil. Okay, so I have to draw a curve for the trefoil complement, um, which looks so. And then I will pair it with translates of HFL of P. Okay, there's a convenient way of sort of organizing the way to do that. I'll just draw translates in here, and then I'll also draw translates of this S1 like this. Okay. And uh, so this, for example, gives me the knot floor homology in Alexander grading 2 
there's one generator. Here I have Alexander grading one. You see these two generators. Here I get A equals zero. This will give me A is minus one. This will give me A is minus two. Okay. All right. So one thing to notice here okay, is that um, it's kind of immediately obvious why Hedden found a formula for the non polar homology of the cable in terms of sutured floor homologies. Okay, because here I'm pairing with a bunch of little line segments here, okay, which are just giving me the sutured floor homologies. So we could make that formal. Um, so let's say. L M is linear. If HFL of L is a direct sum of line segments, and I'll just write L alphas here. Okay, there might be several with the same slope. They might be translates of each other. That's totally fine. And then a corollary is that if um, say P inside of S1 times E2 is linear, um, there's a formula for the link floor homology of a satellite. So not floor homology of a satellite, HF. K hat of P of C is just a direct sum over, let's say, alpha in little HFL of the pattern. And then I just take SFH of exterior C with slope gamma of alpha. Yep. So I say, uh, ah, okay, good question, right? So there, yes, okay. <laughs> this curve looks non-compact, but in fact, that's just because I've, I've drawn this in a covering space of the space that I actually should have taken the pairing in. You'll notice that like if I were to translate up by one, um, I would get exactly the same picture. So really what I should be doing is I should be dividing out by that translation. Um, and that's just because uh, this curve that I drew for the trefoil is really some cover of a curve that I, you know, the real invariant of the trefoil complement. Okay. Um, so this kind of raises the question, well, what kind of knots are, what kind of patterns are linear? Um, and well, some but not all, in particular sort of simple looking knots, maybe have linear patterns. So here's a theorem. It says that suppose maybe L is K1 union K2 inside of S3 is alternating. Um, and that uh, K2 is an L space knot. Then I could look at K2 inside of the exterior of K1. Um, this is linear. And in fact, L K2 is determined by the multivariable Alexander polynomial and the signatures of L. Okay. So, for example, any two bridge link. Okay. 
Okay, so lots of simple patterns are linear. Another interesting pattern that's linear that doesn't fit this criterion is if I take maybe Zn, this is S1 times n points inside of S1 times P2. It's an example of a linear pattern. Um, but uh, for example, uh, tables of two bridge knots. are not usually linear. Okay, so the reason there was a formula is that we got kind of lucky and we had a simple answer for the link floor homology of the pattern. Um, yeah, that's so, but you know, if I'm just thinking about pattern knots, if I want a, something that actually gives me a pattern, then I need to take K1 to be the unknot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, another thing you might ask about is sort of. Maybe I just don't want to know the groups here, um, but I might also want to know what are the differentials. Um, okay. um, and well, if I want to know what the differentials are, Here, for example, um, I would have differentials um, this out of S3. I could take sort of horizontal or vertical differentials, two different sets. And um, wh what does that correspond to? Well, geometrically, it corresponds to the fact that um, Cylinder, I'm going to draw the cylinder. Consider this non compact object. That's just L alpha. Well, I could, there are two different ways that I can kind of add a differential to that. Okay, to get this curve, or add a differential going this way to get this curve. Um, Okay, this differential on it. And pushing those forward, you have to make an appropriate assumption about the not sort of not being non-trivial in the right group. Um, you'll find that there's some sort of differentials on this thing. The W that go to HF hat of S1 times D2. And in, in this in instance, the differentials are really easy to see. There's only one thing that they can be. Um, so what they correspond to is kind of pushing off um, these corners. So there's one push off that goes like this way, and another push off that goes the other way. Okay. And you know, finish with two observations. One is that if I push off either of these two ways, I can straighten the curve that I, that I get out to just be a straight line curve, invariant of S1 times D2. Um, and, but they're in different positions. It's separated by kind of a height, height two. Okay, that's really just the fact that the linking number here is two, telling us that height difference. Um, and then, so the second remark is that, um, so a nice paper of Wen Zhao Chen um, that tells you sort of 
doesn't say it in this way, but it tells you exactly how to find these differentials for one, let's say, two bridge complements. Okay. Um, and so, in particular, for two bridge complements, it's, uh, it's always the case that uh, actually these differentials just correspond to gluing these pieces of string together. So you could ask whether that's true in general, and that's, I believe, going to follow from something that uh, Wenzhou Chen and Jonathan Hanselman are working on. Okay, so I think I'm over time and we'll stop now. What about uh, cobordism maps? Okay, so um, good question. I, I haven't thought much specifically in this case. Of course, you expect cobordism maps to be given by counts of holomorphic triangles in this picture in general. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, I asked Robert this so a long time ago, and you know, he pointed out a place in the paper relating bordered floor homology to the Kovanov, um, um, to not floor, no, Kovanov to floor homology of the double branch cover spectral sequence um, that should come close to proving that. I, I mean, I think the, the main problem in saying something about cobordism maps is getting the naturality right, um, right? So in order to prove a statement about cobordism, you need to have kind of the right naturality for you know, what these curves are, for example. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. I, I mean, that's, yeah. That, um, Yes, yeah. yeah, that's right. So the, you know, somehow you can push this uh, tube cutting operator around. Um, I don't know what I get to the last, last one if you're doing. Is there any chance that you can curve the patterns that are linear? Is there any chance of characterizing patterns that are linear? Um, so, I mean, you might hope to prove, you know, find some broad classes of patterns that are linear. Um, beyond the kind of examples that I gave. Um, but uh, I mean, like, it's like, you know, you should think, this is a lot like having thin not floor homology or thin link floor homology. I mean, in fact, what's really being used here is just the fact that the link floor homology of this link is thin. Okay, and then it's a totally formal argument just following an argument that's already in the original LOT paper. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for example, I think it's probably pretty hard to characterize all the thin links. Um, and, I, you know, characterizing all the linear patterns is probably similarly hard. 